I wrote a book called Which Bible Would Jesus Use? The Bible Version Controversy Explained and Resolved. And in it, uh, I try to talk about a number of, uh, I try to answer a number of different objections uh, that we get, one of which is, where was the Bible before 1611? Now, how many times have you heard that one? Oh my, where was the Bible? What do we, my answer to that one, and please use it, is I really answer it with a question. Where do you suppose the Bible was after the invention of printing with movable type? Because that changed the entire world. All of a sudden, you could reproduce. It, it wasn't like a, everything before that was we were dealing with manuscripts, handwritten documents. Not anymore. Now, you could set type and reproduce something hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of times and disseminate it like never before in the history of the earth. So, my argument of where was the Bible before 1611, the answer to it is being assembled. All right? We have printing that began in about 1450 with Johann Gutenberg and his, in his printing press. You probably all know that story. The King James Bible was uh, produced in 1611. So you have over 150 years worth of preparation. And it was during that time, I mean, there's a whole history that goes with this, but nonetheless, and you probably are familiar with it. But my, again, my answer is it was being assembled. And there were previous editions of the English Bible, and they were all part of the line. And then finally, the Lord comes out with the King James Bible. Now, that's the one that he disseminated all over the earth. There's been billions of copies disseminated. William Tyndale did his first edition in 1525, and they were all burned. But that was a starter. Uh, then there was the, the uh, Matthews Bible, and Coverdale was the first complete English Bible. Then there was the Bible under Henry VIII, the, uh, uh, the Great Bible, no monstrous piece. Um, and then, of course, the Taverners and the, um, the Geneva Bible, which the Lord certainly used it. There's no question that he used it. Went through 144 uh, editions. So, but again, they had, they had circulation, but not the kind of circulation that the King James Bible has had. Nor did they have the result in the missionary movements that came. As a result of the King James Bible, the gospel got spread the fact that when people got convicted by what God put his hand on, this is one of the things that hit me as an anti-King James person doing the research and the history. When I saw that God clearly put his hand on this, I could not explain it in other terms. The missionary movement, when people came back to the Bible, they came back to the King James. Because each time they got a solid foundation. And even if they went off in a different direction after that, how did they get back to a foundation? Where did the revival get sprouted from? from reading and believing this. Now, just results. Now, this is a result man, okay? This is a man who starts companies and he initiates things and gets them done. He likes results. God likes results. This book is a book that I've watched through history obtain results. You want results in your life? I want results in my life. I don't want to play around with stuff. I don't want to play around with the morality that's around these days. I don't want to play around with the ethics that people have these days. Where do they have it from? I don't know. There's a whole lot of Bibles out, but when my ethics and my morals and my thoughts are trained into what I read in this book, it changes me. It convicts me. It makes me realize what needs to change in my life. In other words, if anybody's serious, prays to God and reads this book, I know it'll produce the results results. You know, um, Winston Churchill said that the King James Bible had been translated, the King James Bible had been translated into 760 languages. So there's a, a testimony of the importance of the King James Bible. It's had 400 years of history. You know, one of the arguments against the King James Bible, is, this, is, this is salesmanship, okay? Um, oh, that doesn't matter. Well, yeah, but what about the 400 years? Oh, that doesn't matter. Well, in sales, when you run into an objection that is monstrous, that you can't, that you can't answer, 
one of the, a sales technique is that you minimize it and move on. And that's what happens. That's what you've heard when you've heard people say, oh, that 400 years doesn't matter. Or what do you mean all those? What about all the revivals? Oh, they don't really matter. All they're doing, that's you're being gamed by a salesman because they're taking a major objection that you have, and it's a legitimate objection. Sometimes objections are, are, not, um, uh, are not minimal, or they're, they're, there's some basis, in fact. But there, look, there is no, you can't walk away from the results that the King James Bible has uh, achieved, that the Lord has achieved by using it. In other words, stamping his uh, seal of approval, if you will, on that book. You can't walk away from those and say they don't count and that's all meaningless. Uh-uh. No. It has the earmarks of the real book. Why? Did, uh, let me think. The revised version came out in 1885. Are you using the revised version? Can you go buy a revised version uh, on at a local Christian bookstore? I guess you could get one on Amazon. How many stars does it have for, for a rating? How many people have done a review on the 1885 revised version? Wait a minute. Well, no, we're not using the revised version. We're using the American Standard 1901. Oh, I guess I'm not going to find that on Amazon. Sure, you can find it from one of the book dealers and get an original one, and maybe you can move it on eBay for about five bucks. But at the same time, nobody's using it. Why? Because, and then throughout the 20th century, there were various, what, Goodspeed came up with a Bible. Uh, Moffat. Moffat, yes. I have a, Phillips. Uh, Phillips, I have a Moffat Bible. I don't know what you do. Would you have anybody like a Moffat? Um, so, <laughs> but, I mean, there was all these guys that came up with uh, uh, various versions. And then, well, here's a great idea. Let's revise the revised version, okay? So now we have the revised standard version, mm -hmm. right? Was that 1946 and 52, yes. This is why the man has gone to seminary and knows all these facts and figures. Okay. Oh, who's using that today? Nobody. You know what? They had to come out with a new revised standard well, Actually, first version. they came out with the 1970 revised standard version with some updates. When I was at Florida Seminary, that was the one they used. And then came the new revised standard. I mean, the new revised standard. standard. Okay, standard. so there you go. And then, well, what are we going to do with the uh, ASV, the Old American Standard Version, 1901. Great idea. Uh, somebody came up with a brainchild to, let's revise that, okay? Based on some new uh, manuscript uh, information, we're going to come out with a new Bible. Now, that was called the New American Standard Bible. I think that was 1960. 1963, 70, and they went on, yes. Yeah, various editions? Well, it started You mean out. new copyrights? Well, yeah, well, they, yeah they the biggest the one, the biggest copyright change was 1995. Oh, so you, you mean the text changed? Yeah. My goodness, God just can't seem to get his, his Bible right. It has to keep being fixed. Yeah. I mean, that is so, it's so sad. Isn't it so, well, now, so... Their God. I mean, that's not what? my God. My God doesn't do that. No. See, my God does it one time, and this is one of the questions that a friend asked me. If God did it right once, why does he need to do it again. Jesus didn't stand there in the synagogue and said, you've heard that it was written, but oh, dear, this is a bad copy. Excuse me. This is not what I said to Isaiah. Yes. No, he didn't. And when he talked to Timothy, uh, Peter, uh, Paul, excuse me, talking to Timothy, said, from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Don't let anybody say, oh, that doesn't matter. That's only referring to the originals, because no, it's not. He said, from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures. That whatever copy of a copy of a copy of a copy that Timothy had was holy scriptures. There's a confidence in the transmission. And then God also wants us to have translation. Otherwise, how could we even have what we have now? We have translations and we have copies that came down that were translated. God had to oversee that. That's why he promised from this generation forever. God preserved his word. God says he will take care of his word. He watches over his word to perform it. He also has to keep it because we can't obey it if we don't have it. Amen. We have to have the very words of God. It's up to him to provide them to us, not the scholars. It's not that 
it may sound silly, but it's, it's, it's really a God thing. It's up to him to provide those words to us. And really what we've been taught is that he didn't do it. He kind of did it. You know, he's like a, um, a quarterback that could lead his team down to the uh, five-yard line, but somehow he just couldn't punch the ball in. He, was, he, he just fell apart. No, that's not the way the Lord is. He brought the ball all the way over the goal line. He didn't give you almost all his words. And, and you can read... Uh, lots of guys that will tell you that we have 98% or 99.5% or, I mean, you've seen those. Yeah, 99 right? and two-thirds percent yeah. pure. It, it sounds like soap. <laughs> it sounds like soap. But nonetheless. It is soap. It is it's soap. A bunch it's, of a, soap. A, it's a bunch of soap. Big time <laughs> soap. It's a soap opera. So, in other words, we are asking you to believe that God sent his son, born in a virgin, and came as God in the flesh, became a man, and that something he did on a cross paid for your sin and my sin, that all we have to do is put our trust in that person and what he did in shedding his blood for us, and our sins would be forgiven, and oh, it didn't stop there. He died and was buried, and three days later he rose from the gra grave, and then he ascended 40 days later into heaven, and that God is not able to preserve a book? Seriously? Does that make any sense? And secondly, if all the things that we believe are true, then we better have a book that we can rely on. That, And if you look at, oh, for example, I was um, uh, looking at uh, a Muslim website that was dealing with the um, problems of, uh, well, why, here, this is why you should not believe what a Christian tells, what the missionaries tell you. It's an anti-missionary site. Well, and a lot of the things they were saying about Bibles were true because they just use textual criticism, textual critics, and their comments about the Bible and why it's unreliable. And they just said, well, look, these fellas, uh, they all tell you why it's no good. Well, they're not listening, they're not presenting the case of a King James Bible believer because King James Bible believers actually believe the crazy idea that God preserved his words between the covers of a book. How simple is that? Doesn't that sound like something God might do, is preserve his words between the covers of a book? And not only that, that he kept his own promise Thank you. to yes. preserve his own words. And on the Muslim thing, I mean, I'm just like going, yes, amen, amen. Because, see, I got a friend from the Philippines on my Facebook just sent me a text telling me about how there's a gentleman who's crying who literally had been brought to Christ and then brought his family to church and then some Muslims told him about the Bible issue and how here they say God is not the author of confusion but look at all these different Bibles and how confusing they are and he left into Islam and not until my friend, you know who you are, went and spoke to him and gave him tracts and talked to him about God preserving right. his word, he came back to Christ. He's like, he was crying. He was so happy to see that he could say that, no, God has kept his word. But I got more than that. My oldest son, he goes out on the streets and he witnesses to people. And you know, he talks to Muslims of all ages. And you know, they all say the same thing. They all say, well, you believe in this big, all these different Bibles that change and are different. And he says, no, many people do, but I don't. Well, what Bible do you have? The King James? He says, as a matter of fact, yes. And that's the end of the discussion. It literally shut them up, and my son could witness to them, because he said, no, God did keep his promise, he did preserve his words, and this is it.